Welcome to Romero Records Virtual Cast. Today we have on David from Mixbus TV. How's it going, man? All good, all good. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everybody who's joining and watching this. Yeah, so uh, as I was telling you, uh, I found you from uh, Ryan. He, We are big engineers and we, we love just uh, learning about the music business and learning about you know different things as far as like analog gear software plugins and all kinds of stuff and as everybody can see you have plenty of it in the background <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah i'm, I'm kind of known for for my hardware collection <laughs> let's put it this way which never ends and always always grows and actually I have no more space i have like stuff in the boxes at this point i don't know where to put it but yeah that's um yeah i'm a i'm a mix and mastering engineer based in los angeles california i happen to have a youtube channel because it wasn't planned for it to become you know as big as 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 it is now and uh lately i'm also uh let's call it creative director and artist development uh that's also something i found myself again uh doing uh, in the past at this point, three years, three, four years since I moved back to Los Angeles. And um, that's that's the bulk of what I do. <laughs> so when you started into music, uh, what, what was your plan just to learn or were you a musician first? Like, how did you start? I, I, I did. I was a musician. I was a professional musician. Um, uh, I was signed with uh, at the beginning with Universal Record. I did uh, with my band, it was called Hellfire Society. And um, we did two albums and signed with Universal Record, the first the first album. And then we danced Macabre Record, uh, the second. And um, <laughs> that wasn't a, a great experience, let's put it this way, but everything happens for a reason. And, you know, we'll, we'll get to that later. But, um, you know, at, at the beginning, when you sign, the, the, you, you, you fight for years, like many, uh, to get a contract, a, a record deal, right? And when you finally sign with a with a record company, and in my case was a major, you kind of tell yourself, oh, "We made it," right? But <laughs> that's that's not the case. That's not the case for most, unless you are at the top or their or their priorities or, or the top of the list, right? So. And when I when I was in a band, um, those years we're talking about two thousand and eight, so a life ago. At this point, um, those were rebranded later on, the shelving years, mm. where a lot of record labels. What we're doing back then was basically buying off artists that were they could potentially hurt their main acts. Let's put it this way. And, you know, unless you have legal guidance, you don't know, you don't know. You, you think, hey, this is it, right? It's, it's a record deal. That's what everybody wants. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, if you're not at the top of the list, they don't promote you. And without promotion, there's, there's no life for an artist. Mm -hmm. That was true 20 years ago and it's true even more today. And it's true for everything, if you think about it, because it doesn't matter how good the product that you have is, no matter what you sell, if you sell t-shirts or if you sell music, if people don't see it, if you don't find a way to put your product in front of the people, they simply don't know about it. So it doesn't matter how great it is. And while back then, we were talking about decades ago, if you had a great song, you, you had a chance that just by word of mouth, you know, uh, you could get to a lot of people and actually break to fame even because there wasn't there wasn't the, the, the same amount of new songs and new artists that, that we have today, right? Uh, back then, you needed a lot of money to actually record even your music, you know, let alone to release an album. It was like a, a very close circle that, you know, the, the average Joe didn't, they couldn't before the digital era you just could not record or release your music so if you were uh, at the point where you actually could get your music out there was a chance that if you had like a good song a good product you know by word of mouth you could make it but 
you know, since the music business turned so hardcore into a financial business, like where where the only the only goal is the, the only bottom line is profit, then you know, and with the with the easy access to recording and releasing music that we have today, that's unthinkable because you wake up to your uh, <laughs> mailing list from Spotify and it says like here check out those 1500,000 new songs for you. <laughs> nobody's gonna, you know, nobody's gonna, <laughs> you don't have the capacity, people don't have the capacity to check out all the new music that is out there. And anyway, that's how I started. And um, unfortunately, it didn't go that, that relationship with the, with, the, with the label didn't go that well. Uh, they shelved us basically. So they didn't do any promotion. We were doing, live shows and even good tours like around the world but it wasn't enough you know and i was doing industrial music in at, at a time where industrial music was at the absolute top we're talking the golden era of rammstein and corn and like where those bands which are still big so that's a testament to how good they were they they were at the absolute top so even if I was in the mid tier, there, there were such a gigantic acts at that at that time that was like really hard, and we didn't got paid for anything that you know regarding that first album. Uh, I had actually three songs go. Yeah, no, nothing. I actually had three songs on um, on a very popular video game. You might guys know it. It was a uh, it was Rock Band Three. You know when you play the fake instruments and stuff. Um. Uh, one day one of our friends called us i was with my bass player and he said like guys that's awesome your songs are on rock band 3 i'm playing with them and we were like what are you talking about because <laughs> we had, you know we had no idea we nobody told us because we basically with that contract we signed off our souls to them they had complete control over the masters over everything so they could do it legally without telling us um so yeah we went on youtube <laughs> like people that were they, there are still videos up on youtube or people playing with our old songs and we were like the hell is happening like we at that point it was probably one year into the contract we had a contract for six years uh three albums one one album every two years and uh we were trying at that point after one year in to get in touch with the label and they didn't pick up the phone either at that point. Because they were just, you know, that that at that point you kind of start to see what was happening, and uh, <laughs> we put a lawyer uh, to, because you know this didn't sound right, and the lawyer said like, yeah, no, they are in breach of contract, one hundred percent, but <laughs> if we do go through, it's probably gonna last years and years and years. You have no idea what are you gonna get at the end of it if you're gonna get something because. You know they have like lawyers on the payroll and so we um the only thing that we were able to do was um for the label to cut the contract there and then we released a second album with a with a big independent which was dance macabre record at the time and but at that point i was kind of fed up with this bullshit and uh the the kind of the rock star life wasn't wasn't for me was never for me mm. i liked you know, I like to write music and, you know, because I had something to say and because I, I just like to make music. But the, the life, or the backstage life and the parties and the drugs and the, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do shit. Like I, <laughs> I was the guy that was just going to bed after playing, you know, and so um, fortunately, I had a plan B without knowing it. Mm -hmm. As in, while I was a musician, I was already engineering. And I started out of frustration because when we were doing the first album, I couldn't, I wasn't happy with the sounds that we were getting, especially for like guitars and stuff like that. And um, I was like, you know what? Just let me try. I know something, you know, some things. Let me sit, take a break, work case scenario. We're going to be back where we were. And after a lot of trial and error, because I wasn't trained at that point, I was just going with instincts and the few little things that I picked up here and there, I made it, you know? And I gotta say like the sounds that I did like at this point, like almost 20 years ago, still hold up mm -hmm. somehow. And um, at that point I was like, you know what? Maybe I, I can actually do it. And I realized that I enjoyed 
the studio life better because it was more my environment, calm. I'm a Virgo, so I'm like very detail oriented. And it was like, I was feeling very at home there. And uh, other people heard, you know, my album and they asked me to um, do the same for them. And because of the second album, it's funny because I started my career as a mix engineer uh, from kind of a, like a higher point because because of my band and the label, I my one my one of my first gigs uh, were um, an, an official remix for Ladytron and Felix the Ausscat. <laughs> so like that was like you know already like pretty big and you know both went on charts and on the official remix album for those two artists. And then after that, of course, I started from the bottom, like local bands and, you know, started building up portfolio and, and, and you know, credits and shit. But yeah, that's how I started, like out of complete frustration. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very hardcore on everything I do. So when I, when I start, uh, when I have an interest in something, I just put my head down and I study every single thing that there is to know about that thing. And that's why companies like to work with me because I'm so detail oriented when I, you know, review a piece of gear or, or a plugin, I know every single thing that is in, you know, in my gear and why. <laughs> and that's, that's how it went. So do you feel like that experience that you had with the label and everything that went on I mean, it sounded like it fueled the fire to who you are, but do you feel like that was sort of necessary to get you to where you are? I think absolutely yes, for several reasons. One, because first of all, being a musician, I think it, it simply, so more knowledge is never a drawback. It's always an advantage, no matter what you do. So being on that side of the glass as a recording artist, gave me that perspective that then, then I can use now being behind the glass in understanding that sometimes musicians and artists, um, they have troubles even telling you what they want. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't use the right terminology. Maybe they don't, they don't know it, or maybe they think they want something, but they don't. So I think if you were, if you, if you have a background as a musician, you kind of speak the same language of musicians and you and you kind of have the same thought process when going into a studio recording or into a mix if you know they assist the mix and that makes your job easier and the result better because you kind of understand better what they want or what they are trying to tell you because half of the job of, a, of an engineer is really translating what they think more than what they say into a sound <clears throat> Sometimes an artist can tell you, like I had an hip hop artist that he he was dead on that he wanted a '70s drum, right? And I tried several <laughs> styles of the '70s drum up until I understood that he thought he wanted a '70s drum, but that no, that was not what he wanted, right? It was completely different, and he somehow thought that that was the '70s sound. Mm -hmm. And this is just one example, but. Um, that's for sure. So the experience as a musician definitely gave me a different kind of sensitivity, if you, if you can call it that way. And as far as the, the deal with the, the uh, business side, it also definitely helped me. First of all, because you start understanding what, what, what happens behind the scene. So not only musicians have deals and agreements with labels but mixing engineers too you know a lot of big mix engineers some people think like artists knock at their door and hey mix my album it doesn't work that way like at a certain level some mix engineers have deals with record label and they just give them the album that they're going to be on charts mm -hmm. you know the artist maybe doesn't even know who's going to mix it sometimes they don't even care <laughs> so I started also understanding that, but most important, and that's why I, at the beginning I said everything happens for a reason. It's because now that I have um, my artist, Bella, um, I know what to look out for. I know what not to do. <laughs> I know that a record deal doesn't mean anything if they don't promote you, if 
also they they take ninety five percent and you take five percent. <laughs> you you can you can you know throw that contract out of the window because it doesn't do anything to you. And um, in modern time, can give you like a, a six months of fame, but that's not equal money, first of all. And even if you are smart and you know a lot about business and how to market so other things, because basically modern modern music market is you use the music to sell something else. Look at all the biggest musicians, right? Uh, Rihanna has Fenty. Uh, Jay Z has like whatever you know. Everybody has all their business, in aside from merch and all those things. But if you have a shitty contract with a label, you you won't even have enough time to set up a, a true fan base that you can then you know uh, count on for whatever whatever endeavor you're gonna you know is gonna be next for you. And um, so I I know that I know what to avoid and how to avoid all the traps that um, the music industry has placed for you <laughs> along the way. Have you ever thought about managing an artist? Um, I know you said Bella, but is, do you plan on expanding that or do you just want to keep it small? Um, I, we do plan on expanding, but still remaining boutique. Hmm. As in, it's not going to be like a, I don't know, like an automated chain, right? We don't work. I, I, I say we because, of course, I have a team right now that works for this. Pro this is the biggest project. Bella is the biggest project. Uh, her second single passed a million on YouTube. The previous is uh, over 750. And those are like her first two songs. So it's going well. But we still want to remain boutique. We still want to handpick the artist. And, you know, artists that we do believe they they can be you know successful uh successful is is it's kind of a shitty word um let's say artists that we want to be proud of because mm. unfortunately success today it, it's especially the last year it's crazy it, it kind of seemed that nowadays musician being a musician equal doing stupid dances and being a clown on tiktok more than actually making music yeah. you know and and of course there's a reason because of that because record labels are for the most part many of them controlled by you know finance companies and uh and they don't want to take risks they don't want to take risks they don't it's the era in which they see an artist and there's real a and r that believes okay this artist has talent and i can you know build something that lasts uh because Again, there's so there's such a such an easy access to the music making process. They don't want to take any risk. So I always tell musicians because I do consultations for musicians, right? And um, and I always tell them like you need to see the labels today as a company that is not really interested in your music. is is interested. It, it sees you as a small business. If your small business is already making money, then they might be interested in you. If it's not, <laughs> they're not. And if you have a two, three, four million followers on Instagram and, and TikTok and whatever the fuck it is, they have their promotion paid for already. Because think about it. You have 10 million followers spread across two, three, you know, uh, social media and 10% of them buy your song or 10% of stream, stream your song. That's, that's already a good number for them. You know, they, they, Basically, you, you add a little bit of promotion on the mainstream, which they have access for, you know, they, they have access period because for a lot, a lot of outlets are not accessible for the average, you know, musician. And there you go, you have the numbers. And then they don't care about longevity because next month there's going to be another one. That's very unfortunate, actually. It's very unfortunate because this, this way, they do a couple of things by doing this. One, they keep all the power because they basically, um, the, the artist at this point is, is, uh, is, is it, it, it's, uh, it's easy to replace, right? So they don't have to rely on those three, four artists that have talent that they have to actually pay and they have power because, you know, you can't replicate what Adele does, right? Yeah. 
you can't, you know? And so they, they want replaceable faces. So they hold all the power. And if you say, no, I don't like this contract, they tell you, all right, fuck off. There's another, you know, 25 out there waiting at the door. And unfortunately, when this happens and the bottom line is always and only the money, the music suffers, the cost, the, 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 the end user suffers as well. And the artists, because we all know how much, you know, artists get paid today. And we see a little bit of change, you know, in the past two years, I think probably it's very slow, but you start seeing artists pulling their songs off Spotify and going more for, hey, you want to hear my music? Come to my website. But it's, I think it's, there's hope. I want to say, I want to believe that there's hope because I see even from my, from my subscribers that a lot of people say like, you know what, I'm, I won't, like, for example, when I mix something or I master something and, and it gets released, if they, if I remember and I keep track or they tell me, I repost them. I want to help out the artists that are independent. And I know, you know, because they spend a lot of money to do work with me. So I, I know that it, if it's going to help, it's going to be appreciated. I repost it and I tell, hey guys, you know, check this. This one is one of my latest mixes. Check this artist out. A lot of, a lot of people say like, I won't give money to Spotify or Amazon. Fuck them. If they have a website, if they have like Bandcamp, if they have something, I will happily go there and buy their song. So I think even the average people start, it, it, they heard enough mm. of how shit it is for artists that they kind of, a lot of people I feel develop this kind of, you know, sensitivity and they go like, you know what? Fuck these guys. Like I, I, I'll gladly pay the artist like that $1 for, for streaming. Which you know, I, I hope more and more people will will do. And if and and also, this is just I, I use your platform for a message for all you know. Hopefully, will help all the artists. Think that if you if any if if an independent artist has a T-shirt or a or a baseball cap or a keychain, any any piece of you know merchandise, um, don't see that they want to speculate, but see that that, that that's probably literally the only thing that. It will, it will allow them to keep doing what they're doing and to produce music. Because if you buy one T-shirt, it's probably half a million streams on Spotify. <laughs> yes. You know, which is crazy. So I've never if, thought about that. Yeah. If you, if you want to, like, if you like an artist right now, I want to say just go to the website, see if they have something. If you have like a, even a postcard, you know, a signed picture, it doesn't like, you know, it, 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 it's literally like half a million or a million equivalent streaming on, on Spotify and they will still get like 50 cents after that. And, you know, and so I, I think that's, you know, that's, that's important for people to know. Do you feel like there's enough people, like you seem very passionate about this. And, oh yeah. And I love it. Do you feel like there's other people like you, whether it's engineers, producers, uh, managers who are in the industry that are helping, I guess, change and shift this this culture. I I think that um, there's definitely musicians that have passions and they kind of for either it's a choice or a forced choice. They kind of want to not get in the market game, right? I'm gonna put my music out because I'm passionate about it, and whatever happens happens fuck off because a lot of people understand that they're they're the gatekeepers are still there and are still as strong as ever mm. unfortunately so and um as far as other figures i think there are a lot of passionate people and i think those are the people that are keeping the machine going because otherwise we would be in trouble <laughs> and um unfortunately are the minority or let's let's put it this way even if they are not the minority they don't have enough enough power or as much power as the people that pull the strings in the big market you know but but i i i definitely think that there are those people and all the people that i work with we kind of see eye to eye because otherwise it's impossible to even go in a project like this like breaking an artist to fame and my artist, like she started from scratch. It's mm. the hardest thing you can possibly do unless you are in the label and that it's called an industry plant <laughs> or you have unlimited budget for promotion, like unlimited, like 
millions of dollars. That's some some things that like I, I think some musicians that don't have enough enough experience with the business side of it don't understand. They're like, wow, ten thousand dollars. That's a lot to spend on I don't know promotion. Make it three million mm. to even make a dent if we're talking about the big market. All right. But I definitely think there's passionate people. I, at least I found few. And you know, I, I wanna I wanna say when when you find those people, just you know, work with them. That try to sit down and see if there's some way you guys can collaborate. Because I think it's I b- truly believe it's the only way to make it, whatever the, the term, you know, whatever you know meaning you want to give it to that, uh, in in the music industry slash business it's because maybe you won't ever hit top 10 billboard but that doesn't mean much there's a lot of very successful artists out there that are not known in the mainstream world but they make a living out of it mm. and you know th- if you ask me that's success i i wake up in the morning and i'm i can't wait to start working because i do what i love and I, and I feel extremely blessed that I can pay my car, my cows, my bills and my everything, my travels with this because I absolutely love to do that. You know, I don't care if I work with a least, you know, clients or not. Um, you know, I think that's that's the that's the my definition of success and also to have a somewhat balanced life, which I didn't have before. I was like you know, head down, I was just working 18 hours a day, then go to the gym and then call back and working and just remember to eat to sleep at some point, <laughs> you know? And uh, and there's also that one, I, I'm here in LA and, I, and I'm and i friend with like many, many, many engineers that work at the absolute top. And um, while that's an absolute, that's absolutely amazing thing, if that's your thing, and uh, it's, it's, it's definitely like a goal for many, it's not all sunshine and rainbow because when you work at that level, you're on, on a lot of pressure and you have to deal with, let's put it this way. You have to deal with a lot, you know, you have to deal with a lot. Sometimes you have to deal with, like, for example, if I mix for some, some artists, usually this is how it goes. I, the artist or the manager contacts me, you know, I do the mix and nine times out of 10, there's not even one revision. Thank you. That's amazing. See you next time. Right. And at, at a certain level, the higher you go, and usually is okay, the artist has to approve, the AR has to approve, the other guy from the label has to approve, then the the, the girlfriend of the artist has to approve. <laughs> then their dog and their grandma as well have something to say. You know, and, and I and I know this for a fact, like guys that I know are they're going, oh my God. And, you know, it's sometimes it's just, you know, you kind of have to decide, is it worth it? Is it really the life that I want? Like every single day to deal with it kind of stuff. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think that there's there's still a lot of talented and passionate people in, in the business for sure. So I actually want to take some time. Here's some promo for Bella. Let's talk about what she's doing and uh, where she's at. And um, Absolutely. How- how you're trying to to get her to that to that echelon of of uh, performance so um as soon as i again the stars are lining as soon as i i never ever imagined i would go into this into artist development and at this point creative direction of the entire project but um as when i moved back here uh, a common friend of me and bella um she she was a, an actress before, so she started acting when she was like six years old. She already had a, an IBD thing, you know, movies and TV series and shit like that. But she didn't like it, and she wanted to do music. Um, so a friend, a common friend, um, they were looking for a producer, and um, for to start. And um, the common friend said, like, "Hey, you need to check out this girl." She was very young and very green at the time, but I remember that moment just like it was yesterday because we met uh, at an event, uh, Westlake Pro here in LA, and they introduced each other and she said, hi, that's it. That, that's all she, she said, hi to me. And I'm like, wait, what? What was, what was that sound that came out of your mouth just right now? Like, say it again, you know? 
And she has this voice that sounds like a, a freaking fairy, like in real life. It was like, what the hell? And that was basically like enough because, you know, she's beautiful and everything. And she had this voice. So um, we kind of, all right, what did you do so far? What do you have? Do you have demos? Do you have anything? She had a couple of old, old demos when she was still acting and she had to sing a few songs for uh, some things. And um, we kind of went in studio. We kind of started listening music and just talk to each other. Like, what do you like? Who are the, the artists that you like? Let's see. I had to create, you know, a, a, a style for her or understand what her style was, you know, where she felt comfortable with, what her skills were other than the beautiful voice that she had, because there's a billion, you know, girls with a beautiful voice out there. And so we started, um, she, she told me like Lana Del Rey was one of her, you know, uh, inspiration and other, like she, she, she was listening to like 70s music or, and she, her, her range was like so wide. I was like, well, that's, that's just already a good thing. Uh, and then from there, we, we kind of established if where we wanted to go, right? So what, was, what, what is our final goal, right? So we want to hit the mainstream. We're like, we want to try to like go up there. And long story short, after that, um, it was six months past where... She tried, she, I, I told them like, pick like songs or bits that you like and try to write something. Let me see where, what we have, like a core idea or something. And six months passed and uh, nothing, you know, she, she brought a couple of songs every week and I was like, ah, no, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And every time she did that, we sat there in the studio and just work a little bit on things just so we, um, we could get her going. Six months in, she brought one song that was good. It was 100% candy pop, but was good. Hmm. And I was like, okay, all right, we can start here because we are not going to hit Billboard with the first song. So it's fine. We can do, we can do this. So we did this song. She was super happy. We did the video and everything. And after that, I think that the fact that I said yes, it kind of, it kind of, broke something like it, a wall came down at that point and i think she she just thought like i can do this mm. so one week after we filmed the video she came back to me with like 16 songs and they were like <laughs> amazing they were like amazing they were like so deep and and just a complete different level from the first one which was like very pop candy pop and I probably there took the, the, hard, the hardest decision in this project. And I said, guys, we can't release this. Like, think about it. We recorded it, mixed, mastered, filmed the video. Everything was ready to go. I was like, we can't release this. We need to, we need to, put, it in, we need to put it away. Because it's not the artist that she is now. Mm. You know, it, it wasn't. It was completely different. And we were, if I was to release that, that would have put her in a category that it did not belong to her at all. It would have killed her career. Yeah, yeah. So it was, again, a, a risky decision, a hard decision, but um, we, we scratched that. And um, we had three ballad song, very like, she writes very emotional lyrics. And that's, that's, that's I discovered later, that's her talent. She's an amazing lyricist. And the top line that she writes are just as amazing. And the crazy thing is you can tap on a table and she will come up with a top line in <laughs> two minutes, like right there. And at that point, I discovered, okay, so yes, your voice is amazing. You have the look, but that's your talent. Your lyrics are amazing. Your lyrics can really touch people. So we had these three songs uh, that were ballad, very deep, very emotional. And um, we were kind of late. And we had a fourth song that became the first single that's called Throat. And that was like completely different than the others. It was like a, a trap metal song. Hmm. And sure when I was going to, when I was going to uh, play these songs to, to my people in the industry, everybody liked the ballads and stuff. But once we played Throat, everybody was jumping off the chair and was like, holy shit, that's amazing. And so we thought, you know what? 
again, we're not going to hit Billboard with the first single. So we're going to make a video for Throw and release it and see what happens. Worst case scenario, we don't care because the rest of the songs are not really like that. And the video got out and um, it was uh, 700. Now, right now, it's sitting almost a million, 750. And she went on like 20, 15 magazines as a debut single. Um, Outboard Magazine took the exclusive feature for the release. So it was amazing. Then we released the second single, which is called Heartbreak Motel. And that uh, was four or five months ago, I think. And it passed a million right now. And after that, we had both styles and we had audience for both styles. So we kind of had to find a way at that point to blend these two styles. And this is where we are now. We are now about to release the third single for her, uh, which her music turned out to be, we have like about 10 songs ready to go. Her music turned out to be at this point, very cinematic and, and kind of a cyberpunk dark pop mm. that's 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 where from now on is going and what we're trying to do is an important thing which is sync her music to movies and tv series and that could also lead to roles at the same time mm. so this is you know this is kind of a like inside information <laughs> and um so this is this is where we are heading right now and um we had um some names that they could chimed in and you know for example we have a song called felony where uh my buddy mike um mike ransom from adima the new metal band they came he came in he put guitars with me on it we will have like some other collaboration uh, in the future for example like monty pitma uh, uh guitars from madonna and ministry and you know other 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 friends and colleagues here that are i've either worked with or we're friends with and they like her and they like her stuff like Matt Starr, drum drummer from uh, for uh, Ace Frehley, you know, and and a lot of a lot of people. And um, yeah, we, we I think I think with her the key is is kind of cross contaminating genres, which has been part of my mix engineer career for a long time. You know, I, I I've done a lot of metal and rock, and then I you know I mix MC Solar and we won double platinum with with a hip hop album basically. So. It's like, you know, it's crazy, right? But that was kind of, you know, my my thing with the mixing it. And it kind of, everything came so naturally, you know, uh, between my influences, her influences, which was very different. And then we have a, a, another key uh, person in the team. His name is Chris. His influences are, again, completely different. So this fusion of these different backgrounds kind of shaped um, the style of her music, but you still have kind of a thread that kind of glue all the songs together, which is her top lines. Mm. And that's the crazy thing. She can write a top line on a country song if you give her a country song, but it kind of still, you know, like some artists, they have, they have a, a very recognizable style which is a combination of how they sound and how they create, right? That they are comp their musical compositions. Like if you play corn, after the first 10 seconds, you know it's corn. Yeah. And it's a combination of like how the bass sound, how his voice sound and how, what scales they use, right? You know right away. And some artists are, are like that. And I think she has that, which I think it's absolutely important, you know, because whether it's a trap metal song or, or a slow ballad, as soon as she opens her mouth, you know it's her, you know. And and we've seen this happening like many times. And uh, yeah, we had we had a, a great coverage for the press, a lot of interest. She she ended up in a lot of like magazines and stuff. And uh, right now we are we're trying to connect with the movie industry. Um, and also our agent is kind of pushing for that. Is is pushing for this kind of unite a possible roles with the music the soundtracks and stuff and it's you know i think it's a good idea because not only she has a background but she also has the presence of it and it's funny because he's trying to push me for roles because he always says like you look like a bad guy just show up and be a, a bad guy you know and he's right like to be honest yeah he is right he actually had me um 
uh, participate in a video for, for another band that he works with there. It's called uh, We The Commas, and they did this video in the desert. It's kind of a Mad Max video. So it was like, I, you need to be there, you know, because... <laughs> So they had me drive this like Mad Max car and come out like being a badass and everything. But it was pretty cool. It was hot as hell, but it was cool. So yeah, so yeah, definitely. And uh, the new single is probably gonna be out in about three, four months from now. And uh, we'll see what we what we are not gonna do. And I think this is important because I kind of posted something on my community page and I saw a lot of people just resonating with what I said. What we are not going to do is um, is playing the stupid game, right? So I, I I I talk to her and we see eye to eye on this. If the key to success is being a clown and do stupid dances, we are out. Mm. We don't care. That's it. Because it's not what you're signed for when you when you say you know what I want to be a musician. And her her reasonings for wanting to do music other than you know, if you're an artist, you know, you kind of had to get it out of your system. When you write a song, when you write something, it's because if you, if you have passion for it, you kind of have to have to get it out and write. It's, it's your way to express yourself. That's, that's what she does. And um, she also has a, a really tough background, you know, as in a really tough childhood. And she hopes for her songs to kind of help people that might be in the same situation she was before. Mm. So... And she hates social media. She she does not care about fame or glory or nothing. She doesn't know anything about the music business. She's like, like David, you do everything because I don't. I just don't care. <laughs> and I and that's one more reason I think because I don't want to sound biased because she's my artist, but I, I feel that's one more reason because people like her should succeed mm -hmm. because they would be a, a good role model, right? And um, so it, it's not like without wanting to offend anyone, it's not like, it's different than just using your looks to get those million followers and then kind of trick the followers into buying your music because at that point they're following you anyway. Yeah. You know, it, so that's that's not a game we're gonna play. You know, we kind of, that's that's a hard line that we have. <laughs> the music has to speak first, period. And, you know, and, and if you take a look at her, it, she's, she's absolutely gorgeous. So it's not like, she couldn't do that or exploit that side you know it's just it's not something we nobody in the team wants to do so i don't want to take up too much of your time but i could talk about this last part for yep. as long as i live the gear uh let's yep. talk about software and hardware uh, one thing that me and ryan like our next big purchase um we were thinking about the ssl fusion yeah uh, that the mastering type hardware is something that we are really thinking about you know can can take mixes to the next level we were watching your the black box video where you were yep. messing with that thing it was blowing your mind so uh let's let's get into that what, what are some stuff that's in your room or outside your room that you don't currently own that you're like man this stuff is great i would suggest you break the bank and get this thing well the i this is uh this is kind of a uh, it, it it's kind of cliche, but I always say the very first thing you need to care to, to take care of is those two things. Because if you can't hear what you mix, you can mix. <laughs> That's you know the first thing. You can't hear what you you can mix what you can't hear. Uh, that taken out of the equation, um, I think the fusion is an amazing it is an amazing unit. Is an amazing unit for se for se several reasons. First of all, you have a different modules, and each one is very well done. And so it's a very balanced unit. Sometimes when they try to, to shove too many things in one unit, it's not great for nothing. It's just okay for like all those things. But with the Fusion, they did an amazing job, I think. And it's also really cool as a starting piece. Even if either, either that's your first piece of gear or you have gear to integrate, that's great because you can use it as a mini transfer console let's put it this way for mastering where you have an insert you can put whatever you want in insert you can um, change the the position of that insert pre or post eq so for both a professional and a home studio guy i think it's a it's it's a great unit to start with and it's a great unit to to integrate if you already have some stuff um 
Of course, when you when you when you talk about mastering, your converters needs to be there as well, because otherwise it's you know it's kind of it's normal. Your your chain is gonna always is is always gonna be as strong as your weakest link. Hmm. So, um, talking about um, pieces in general, I can tell you like the the lot the latest units that just wowed me. Like the HG two is definitely a unit that wowed me. I'm not sure. Like I do use it in mastering sometimes, but I kind of see it more as a mix piece of gear if anything because the recall on it are a little bit tricky because they're not um they're not switches they're just pots so when you when you go a recall you can be as precise as for example i can be with my west audio mastering compressor which is digitally controlled or my passy q which has you know dance and switches uh, other than that, it, it, it it's an absolutely mind blowing unit. Nothing, nothing sounds like it. Plugins don't even come close to it. Um, so it's definitely a great unit. Um, I would say, for example, West. I love everything that West Audio makes, <clears throat> just for the sound quality. <clears throat> excuse me, but also because they are digitally controlled and they are the only company that do it like really right. I had them for like years and years. Their software is amazing, never glitches. And for those who are not familiar, you basically have a 100% analog piece of gear. This, this one, for example, next to me right here, which is my mastering compressor, that you can recall digitally as a plug-in interface. So what every time you touch one knob, the computer sees that you're touching one knob. And if you want, you can record automation like for example, on the chorus, you want to back off the threshold a little bit. Compared to the verse, you can actually do it on the machine, and it will write your automation and play it back to you later. You know, if you don't want to touch the machine, you can control it from the plugin interface. But the audio pad is one hundred percent analog, and that means you can re you open another project. The settings were different. You will open it by itself because it has presets, and you know, and and you can save stuff. Uh, so that that's an amazing machine, and they have like I have four or five pieces of that from them, and they are all great. But um, the NG Bus compressor is my main mastering compressor. It's just that's one unit that I I would just vouch for it one hundred percent. I also I'm also kind of known for making the spacecraft from Matthew Lane famous, so famous that he sold out. And nobody can buy it anymore <laughs> at least not until the i think fourth or fifth batch is going to be ready like in a year from now but yeah the the matthew lane spacecraft is uh, an absolutely mind-blowing machine nothing comes close to it it's another piece of gear that is just i want to say is one of one of the few pieces of gear that it really wows you you know and maybe you use it 50 percent of the time in mastering you know um but when <laughs> those 50 percent it's, it's just, it just blows your mind. It's like, wow, this is just insane. This is sorcery. And it really is, you know. And I have a video explaining how, it, what it does. And, uh, but it, it's just that, that's a unit that is incredible. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to take a look um, for mastering. Well, you got to kind of have to have an EQ for mastering. Like, at, at least I, I advise people to have a, like a main EQ. And uh, now I have like, I think six or seven. So I'm, I'm like ridiculous. But um, if you want to start with one EQ, for example, a lot, a lot of times people don't have like insane budget. So they, hey, if I had to buy one, which one would you buy? Uh, I always point out either the Mag EQ or the API 5500 hmm. because they are, they are character pieces that plugins can't touch really. And they are versatile enough to be used, you know, probably 99% of the time on your material. And uh, they are kind of affordable. I mean, yes, they're like, I think they're 2K plus each. But I, I say affordable because my SPL is 7.5K. So it's like, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it's ridiculous. Like it, those are, those for me falls into the affordable category. And um, yeah, there's... Stem Audio makes amazing stuff, especially if you are on a budget, but regardless the price. Um, I, I have their 1176, which has three revisions 
A, so the blue stripe, the revision D and the revision G in one box. And you have like, oh. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely mind blowing. And this is the thing. The thing is that each revision is component matched with the original. So it's not like other companies that, okay, so this is what they were used, but we can't find them anymore. So we're going to substitute for that. It's kind of the same. No, no, no. It's got Souter transformers in it. Same as the blue stripe, you know, the, the super rare blue stripe. It's, yeah. It is a blue stripe. And you have three revisions in one. At the, and it costs just like one, 1176. <laughs> okay. And uh, the second one, I just got it like, I don't know how many weeks ago, uh, is, a, is a, another 1176 revision D, but they put a tube circuit in it. Mm. It's the first 1176 with a tube circuit in it in the world, and it's 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 amazing. And you can take it out. I mean, if you do, if you don't want to use the tube, it's got basically the output. You can pull the output knob out, and that engages the output tube stage. And if you don't want it, you just keep it off, and you have a revision D. Which, by the way, I I saw like it, there's two right now on a uh, on on Reverb. They go for like ten or eleven thousand oh dollars. Yeah, and I know the guys personally, so I I know what they put in their stuff, and it's one of the look. This is this is the reality. I can have whatever whatever I want. If something is on my desk, there's a reason, you know. Otherwise, I would make space for something else because you know this is LA. Real estate is expensive, <laughs> so I don't I wouldn't waste you know real estate for something that is not for me. It's like at the top. Um, so definitely, I'm actually. Uh, waiting for a fair child as well that is going to be like on this rack but um let me see what else do we can oh well i can what about your speakers or your monitors so my monitors are eve audio sc3012 they are the biggest model they have of course like <laughs> if they don't may, they might not look like it but they are like absolutely massive they're like 120 pounds each Oh my goodness. And yeah, they are. Yeah, they are absolutely, absolutely massive. And um, in all honesty, I worked with, I think, most speakers out there from the NS tents to the absolutely gigantic uh, ward mounted, uh, both Genelex and Osberger, PMCs, you name it. I work with everything or, or I own them at some point in my life. The day, I've never been so confident about how my mixes translate and my masters translate outside of my studio as I've been since I got these two. Mm. It's just, and look, monitoring is, is a very personal choice, you know? Um, so keep that in mind. But for me, it was just, that's it. That the, 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 the search is over. And I, I stopped. I wasn't doing it that much uh, to begin with, like by the time that I got these, but I stopped checking my mixes anywhere else. Like, you know, sometimes it still happened. Like, you know, let me see how it sounds on the phone. Let me see how it sounds in the car. Let me see how it sounds on the laptop or whatever. Stopped. No, don't need to. Don't, <laughs> just don't need to, like at all. If I do, it's funny because it's for the first time after so many years, if I do listen to one of my mixes on my phone, I go like, holy shit, it sounds great. Like, it sounds even better than I was expecting, you know, which to be honest, like we, we, need, to, we need to be like, you know, like honest about it. Sometimes it happens, even at, at the highest level, you kind of listen to your mix in your phone and it's not, it doesn't have like a 15 inch woofer on it. So you kind of miss something, no matter how great the mix is, right? But for some reason that stopped happening and I'm like, Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't hear the 30 hertz on my phone, which is normal, no matter what you do. But it's so well balanced that it, it's the same mix. And actually now, like, the effect sounds, like, so open and wide. So those really changed a lot for me. You know, the, the guessing game for how little I had before. You know, so sometimes you wanted to double check on other system. It just went away. They have this uh, port, this, 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 they are ported, but the port is on the back. They, are, they have this port that is their proprietary design. And I think, I think, I don't know too much about the technology, but that's my guess. 
uh, that's one of the main reasons as to why their low end is, first of all, it's so extended. I don't have a sub. I don't need a sub because you can, we were, so we were comparing these when I, when I first got them, my room wasn't ready. So I parked them in a echo bar where Bob Horn mixes. He just gave me his room for like a few days. I could park my monitor. We were listening to mine and his Osborger with the sub. And you know, when you listen to like low frequencies, they kind of hit you on the leg. You can hear the vibration on your thigh, right? With these, you hear it on your shin. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like if it, to give you like a, a comparison, it, it felt like there was um, dry, dry ice in a room. And that was the low end hitting on your like ankles. So and one of the reasons, because it, it kind of, it, it, they have this low end that is both extended, but at the same time, they kind of sound like a closed enclosure monitor, not ported because it's so focused. And that I've never, I never experienced any other monitors doing that. And um, the good thing is they um, transfer the technology that you find online. So the Twitter, which is an air, air something, something technology they transferred it on all the models. They don't have, like some companies have like the alpha model and the beta model and uh, the other, you know, the, sh the shitty series and the best series. They don't, they have one series. It goes from this size to this size. They have the same technology. So, I love you know, that. I yeah. Love so there's no guessing game. Like how that, it's, it sounds just, you know, it's got less low end, that's it. <laughs> and that's, this is going to sound the same, you know, the mid range, the top end. So I absolutely love my monitors for sure, for sure. That's awesome. Well, again, don't want to take up too much of your time, but this has been absolutely amazing getting to talk to Thank you, you. Uh, and find out more about, you know, how you started and then your artist and, and all your gear. It's, it's awesome experience. Um, if you Thank can, you. Thank you. Uh, just go ahead and give everybody like, you know, how they can find you, all your info. And, uh, absolutely. And Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I know I talk a lot. So probably it was like, holy shit, this guy talks a lot. But <laughs> as you said, like, I'm passionate. That's why, right? But um, they can find me. Everything is on their Mixbus TV. So YouTube channel, Instagram, TikTok. What do, I don't have TikTok. Uh, <laughs> Twitter, uh, website is the same. It's mixbus.com. And there's a, there's a couple of sample packs if people want uh, that you have like snare sample packs. We have Bella's vocal sample pack and a new volume is going to come out. And um, yeah, um, I also have on the channel a members section. So there's, you know, videos that are free for everybody, but there's also a members only section. So there's full mixing and mastering courses for them. And it starts at $5 a month. So it's just nothing. And um, they can also get mixed consultations with me via email and or one-on-one -on -one lessons. And actually we, we can do like remote mixing, like live. There's some cool stuff we can do. And um, the last thing I wanna say, well, Bella single, new single is gonna be out in about three, four months from now. From now, she has two songs on YouTube. Just look for Bella Kelly. She's gonna pop up first. Uh, Bella Kelly official.com or Bella Kelly official are all her social media. So Instagram again, website, Twitter, YouTube, everything. and. Uh, there's a big surprise coming in August, uh, which I'm gagged because I have an NDA. <laughs> we can't release it, but I just want to tell, like, keep an eye out because in, in August, there's going to be probably the biggest news that ever happened since the birth of the channel. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be like really, really cool. Okay. And um, that, I think that's, that's going to be, that, that's it. Same for whoever, you know, if they want to book for mixing and mastering, all the informations are, you know, on the website or on the YouTube channel or, on, or Instagram everywhere. Awesome. Again, thank you so much for, for coming on. And uh, it, was, it was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. And thank everybody who watched this video. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Awesome. All righty. Well, thank you for everybody for tuning in. And we'll see you next time.